recording started. So we pick up today uh, in the 20th century, uh, predominantly focusing uh, on the uh, Churches of Christ. We have a, a few things to finish up with respect to the premillennialism controversy that arose in the early part of the 20th century, but by, by the end of World War II has largely been um, finished. Uh, there are still a few uh, relatively few churches of Christ, predominantly in Kentucky, that are premillennial, um, but most churches of Christ do not evidence um, that um, that approach to the, the end times. <clears throat> Certainly there are probably more people today um, who might be premillennial and not really realize that if they have um, accepted some of the ideas presented in books like Left Behind, uh, some other apocalyptic types of movies. Uh, so there, there might be some people that are still influenced by that because of the presence in both regular popular culture as well as Christian popular culture, um, who probably wouldn't identify themselves as premillennial because they don't necessarily think of that as a... Uh, uh, you know, know what premillennialism is. Um, most uh, churches of Christ, however, uh, would, and most Christians in churches of Christ would not necessarily uh, fit into that uh, model. Where we finished up in um, the week before spring break was looking at the major source of conflict and largely due to the teachings of a man named uh, R.H. Bull. Now remember, premillennialism had been a viewpoint that several people in um, the 19th century in the Restoration Movement had. Most were postmillennialists, but there were some that were premillennialists, some very prominent ones like Barton W. Stone, Walter Scott for a time, um, it, a lot of people who had been shaped by William Miller and his views on the, and his kind of um, calculations on the end times. So it had been something that had been present, uh, something that was influential in the 19th century, although postmillennialism was largely uh, the, the, um, the major view of a lot of people uh, in the Restoration Movement uh, and even, even through the split. Um, but largely there is this controversy that develops in the 20th century over this issue that had not been a major issue before. Certainly people had kind of expressed their ideas on this, um, had called into question the, um, the other views of um, different um, people on, on this subject. So there was some dialogue on it. But there is a level that develops in the 20th century uh, among the churches of Christ where there is a rather combative uh, approach to this that had not necessarily existed prior to this point. And a, a concerted effort to either convince people that um, premillennialism was not biblical um, or an attempt to try and mark those individuals who were premillennialists, uh, preachers that were sharing that idea, uh, and attempt to either silence them or marginalize them. Uh, you know, something that, that wasn't as much of a, a, a prevalent idea in the 19th century. And I, I think largely because there were other theological issues that we were looking at, uh, that we looked at, that uh, took a lot of the, the focus. So, you know, and, and I think also because it had become such a major part of fundamentalism in the 20th century. So it was becoming a um, major issue in the larger American Protestant culture that it was kind of, you know, something that was in, in discussion in the broad Christian groups that existed at the time. So anyway, um, R.H. Bowl. Um, becomes really the, the focal point of all this because he becomes one of the prime spokespeople for it. 
um, active in writing in the journal Word and Work, had been active uh, writing in the Gospel Advocate, but uh, there is an effort to uh, remove him from being uh, one of the editors of Gospel Advocate, and he ends up writing for Word and, and Work. Having a variety of debates on this subject, we talked about the debate with H. Leo Bowles um, and how, you know, one of the things that for uh, Bowles and others who are becoming opposed to the premillennialist view is how, how the church is viewed in that scheme. Often, a lot of people who took the premillennialist view looked at the ministry of Jesus, or at least stereotypically looked at the ministry of Jesus, as somewhat unsuccessful in certain aspects. Certainly, um, the, uh, the death on the cross was vitally important, fulfilled prophecy. Um, it, was, it was, of course, very important for salvation of human beings. So there's that aspect of it. But the claim also was by a lot of premillennialists, especially as you move through the 20th century, that the church wasn't Jesus' original intent. That it is a measure that is put into place because the Jews did not accept him as Messiah. And so the, the idea becomes that the kingdom was something that still needed to be established because it had been prophesied uh, in uh, the Old Testament, and so the, there was still this need to fulfill these prophecies. So in, in thinking about this, um, you know, a lot of people in the churches of Christ, um, beginning in the 20th century especially, often made a very close connection with the kingdom and the church and appealed to a variety of passages to say that when Jesus established his church, Jesus was establishing his kingdom. And I think that in many respects there's a lot of good scriptural uh, passages that support that. Um, certainly I think that often the explicit connection between church and kingdom, um, you know, overlooks the fact that there are some elements of the kingdom that are still waiting to be fulfilled, um, but not in the sense of an earthly kingdom, as a lot of millennialists uh, saw it. So for a lot of the people within the more mainstream of churches of Christ, the church and the kingdom were the same. So it, there wasn't any unfulfilled prophecy where Jesus was going to have to come back and rule on earth in a kingdom. So when R.H. Bull is preaching these premillennialist outlook um, for a lot of mainstream Christians, it's looked upon as um, a lot of mainstream Christians in churches of Christ, I should say. Uh, it's looked at as saying that the church was not fulfilling the mission that Jesus had established for it. And so there was a lot of, of concern uh, about this. So in between the two world wars, there is this concerted effort to try and eliminate premillennialist teaching from within the churches of Christ. And so a lot of editors, um, preachers, were very active in identifying uh, not only teachers like Bowl uh, and journals like Word and Work, but we're even concerned about the presence of premillennialism uh, at the colleges. And so, you know, it, it became a, a matter of which colleges are faithful and which colleges are teaching premillennialism. So Harding for a while, um, James Harding, who the school was named after, had been a premillennialist. And so there was concern that Harding was premillennialist, especially the president of Harding uh, at the time, uh, in the early 20th century. He denied it. But what further hurt Harding was as these efforts are going about to condemn R.H. Bowles' work and condemn his teachings, the president of Harding refuses to do that. 
when a lot of other presidents of these various colleges and churches of Christ are willing to stand up and condemn his teaching and to refute it uh, and, and those kind of things. And so that further hurt Harding's reputation a little bit because uh, the president of the time uh, didn't uh, join with these other presidents. One of the major individuals involved in this controversy uh, in, as far as uh, the opponents of premillennialism was a man named Floyd E. Wallace, Jr. Um, Wallace was born in Texas, um, often referred to as Floyd E. Wallace, Jr., but actually he had a different middle, middle name than his father did. Usually, it's a, you know, having the same middle name is a part of that, but Floyd E. Wallace, Jr. Uh, was the son of a different uh, Floyd E. Wallace. Um, and very early on, um, Wallace decides to become an evangelist. And he's um, holding gospel meetings, preaching uh, as early as 15, and is very successful at it, uh, gaining a lot of converts um, and you know, encouraging a lot of people to be baptized. And so he's kind of this uh, boy wonder when it comes to, to preaching. Um, he would eventually become uh, editor of the Gospel Advocate. Uh, later, he would uh, start other journals as well. Uh, in fact, one of his journals was, uh, was formed just to attack premillennialism. That was kind of the main reason for that journal. Um, so, ultimately, he becomes the main force in trying to rid Churches of Christ of premillennialism. And so, when it comes down to it, there are basically three issues that become very important for Wallace. Premillennialism, uh, as well as the, uh, which he's against, um, the Christian's responsibility to civil government, which he is very for, um, you know, just kind of patriotic, um, you know, active involvement in, in uh, governmental responsibility. Yes. That the Christians have a civic responsibility to be voting and to be um, supporting the government, those kind of things. And then, and finally, his other main issue during his life uh, was uh, church support for colleges. Uh, and we'll talk more about that here in a little bit, which he was against. Uh, so he's against premillennialism, against church support for colleges, uh, but supportive of uh, you know Christians being uh, patriotic, being very supportive of, of government, which is a slight bit of, of a change here for Churches of Christ. As we noted, uh, you know, when the Restoration Movement begins to split, there's a very heavy influence in Churches of Christ from the stream of thought of Barton W. Stone, David Lipscomb, and others who had um, kind of maintained a position of separatism from um, you know, public life, government, um, those kind of things. Um, and you see that a lot in uh, Lipscomb's own civil government, which, again, kind of remind you that that's, uh, that, that essay on uh, Lipscomb's civil government is due in a couple of weeks, so don't you know, make sure to be uh, reading and working on that. But Wallace, you know, kind of grows up uh, very early on, has those kind of views, has pacifist type of views, but it appears that the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941 by uh, Japanese aircraft um, really changes Wallace's view so that he becomes very patriotic, very supportive of Christians being involved in government, those kinds of things. Ultimately, um, there were some people, of course, that were very concerned about Wallace's attack on Bull, uh, feeling that he was uh, too harsh. Uh, you know, they, they felt that uh, he was, uh, you know, overly combative. But the way he sees Bull is he's kind of breaking off and starting a, a new group. Uh, and he's also, according to Wallace, teaching heresy about the Holy Spirit. Uh, so there's a lot of concern that he has, and there's this this mentality that you know is present in a lot of 
Churches of Christ in Texas in the early 20th century of what some people refer to as the fighting style. Right? That you, it's not just a matter of trying to persuade people, it's you're, you're very active, militant in, in trying to suppress what appears to be heresy. Um, and so Wallace becomes one of the main forces in the, uh, the opposition to premillennialism and is, in many respects, very successful. Um, so that by the end of World War II, um, premillennialism has largely been eliminated from churches of Christ, except for, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, some churches predominantly around uh, and in Kentucky. Um, there, there isn't a, a widespread premillennialist view. Most people in churches of Christ tend to be what we might call a millennial in the sense that the millennium of Revelation chapter 20 is figurative and does not represent a literal reign of Christ on earth for a thousand years. And certainly you'll find different views even within the amillennial view, but essentially this is the idea, is that the millennium is just more of a figurative or symbolic uh, thing in Revelation and not a time to look forward to at the end of time where Jesus is going to set up a kingdom on earth. So most people in churches of Christ today tend to be that way, and I think largely that is due to how effectively Wallace and others had uh, minimalized premillennialism. Um, now, I, I also believe that there are um, good scriptural reasons to be a millennial um, as well. Um, pre, there's problems with premillennialism and its interpretation of scripture. There's problems with postmillennialism and its interpretation of scripture as well, especially Revelation. Um, but I think as, as well that it doesn't gain its hold in churches of Christ because of how active people were in uh, trying to uh, suppress it or, or prevent it from spreading. But as premillennialism conflict ends, there's another conflict that, that begins, and I, I think in some respect, even though we're moving from a theological conflict to more of a sociological conflict, although there's the theology there as well, um, these two things are, I think, uh, very closely connected. So we move from talking about a premillennialism controversy to talking about a controversy that develops over the question of institutionalization. And what kind of institutions can a church support? Um, you know, that, that both of these questions are related to how churches of Christ, you know, kind of split from the disciples of Christ Disciples are trying to present themselves as the more mainstream, fit in with the rest of American Christianity. Um, and churches of Christ are, are trying to establish their identity, um, kind of as counter to that, and calling people to the restoration of Christianity instead of just kind of a variety of denominations all going towards the same direction. But as churches of Christ make their way through the 20th century, they begin to build a variety of institutions. Um, educational institutions, benevolent institutions, things that we've seen in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, um, and a lot of this will lead to conflict over what can a church do, what can a church support, what can uh, the funds um, gathered by a congregation, how can they can be used, um, and how can congregations work together? All of those questions that are really coming to the forefront in the 20th century in Churches of Christ result in what's known as the non-institutionalism movement or non-institutional, or the institutionalism controversy uh, in the 20th century. Now, remember that in the 19th century, Alexander Campbell starts off in the Christian Baptist as being very opposed to any sort of institutionalizing of Christianity. 
So he's against missionary societies. Um, he's against denominational boards. He's against a lot of church hierarchy. Um, bless, bless you. Ooh, because he believes that there is not scriptural evidence to support those kinds of institutions. But eventually, by the 1830s, 1840s, he is supportive of the idea of churches um, cooperating together um, to, especially to work on missions. But as the American Christian Missionary Society developed, as we talked about, there was that opposition to that institutional framework that what a lot of people uh, who tend to be more southern, more rural, uh, lower class, uh, what they tended to see in the missionary society was the first steps towards a denominational type of structure, which is the kind of thing that they had abandoned when they left um, the Baptist Church, the Presbyterian Church, etc. And especially after the Civil War, because of the actions of some Northern Christians in the Restoration Movement, there was an even greater opposition to the Missionary Society uh, in the 19th century. Now, it's that strand that in the break right, becomes the strand that is uh, Churches of Christ. So, out of this strand that is anti-institutional, there will eventually be you know, another side of institutionalization. And there are a couple of different ways that this is prevalent. Now, one way that you begin to see institutionalization in the Churches of Christ is something that is beginning to uh, produce itself in a variety of uh, Christian groups, and that is the, the existence of the Sunday school. Sunday schools didn't exist in Christianity until the late 17th century. Excuse me, the late 18th century, the late 1700s. Now, certainly, Christians had taught other Christians, the Bible was read, as there was an educational um, component to Christianity, especially in the collective worship, but a, as a distinct movement separate from the collective worship service, there wasn't the notion of what we think of today with the Sunday schools. Especially any type of age segregation where you have a division between adults, teenagers, what we today would call elementary school age. And so this is something that really develops in the 1700s, late 1700s, early 19th, uh, 19th century. Starts predominantly in England and then will eventually spread to America. Now those early Sunday schools, in England especially, were not solely focused on religious education. That was a key component of the Sunday schools. But largely, excuse me, largely the focus was on trying to help lower class children develop certain social skills that were important for health and for uh, socialization in society. So, you know, teaching about uh, hygiene and teaching manners. These were some of the things that were an important part of those early Sunday schools. The essential thought behind this was that as these children become more educated, just in general, uh, about life, that they would become Christians because they've become educated, they've become enlightened. And so they would see how important uh, Christianity was to society. Ultimately, this was a, a social project where the Bible becomes a textbook for a better life um, and becomes a way to find uh, success, um, to be a part of society, those kind of things. 
And the reason for the Sunday school was that during the week, a lot of children in this time period were engaged in work. They were economic contributors to their families. Excuse me. Um, so the Sunday was really the only time there was to try and impart some of this learning, impart some of these skills to children. Because for the rest of the week they were working, and they were working sometimes these very long hours. As the Sunday school movement makes its way to the United States, there is a transformation that takes place where the early Sunday schools in England had not been so much about spiritual formation, the formation of the spiritual life, or, or I mean, there's certainly character formation, but there's not as much focus on uh, spiritual life. In the United States, it becomes much more about salvation, spiritual formation, education in the knowledge of the Bible, not just how the Bible can help you live a better life. Now, a lot of this has to do with ways in which there is this transition that's taking place with how conservative Protestants especially, or evangelicals, uh, are thinking about children. On the one hand, they have this viewpoint that they have inherited from the, their Calvinist background that children are born depraved, um, that they... Uh, they're born in original sin. But by the 17th century and the 18th century, there are new views developing about children that are starting to kind of modify this. So when John Locke in the 17th century, for example, starts some of his teachings about how we get ideas and how we gain knowledge, people began to look upon children not as um, depraved or, or um, born with original sin, even though they still claim that because they believe that that was a, you know, that they're, they're shaped by that Calvinist doctrine. Um, and actually, original sin was an older doctrine than Calvin. Uh, but from Protestants, it mostly had been shaped by, by Calvin. Um, so anyway, so they have that as a theological viewpoint, but they're shaped by Locke and others who are talking about children as blank slaves. So this idea of children are born innocent, and it's important to uh, cultivate them and, um, and shape their lives so that they evidence uh, Christian character throughout, instead of necessarily thinking about them in the context of um, depravity. Additionally, there's also this influence of this rejection of the Enlightenment that is known as Romanticism which was a philosophical movement that uh, affected not just philosophy, but arts and science and, and other things as well, that is beginning to shape Christian thinking of children as these kind of spiritual innocence, um, that they um, that they they're actually closer to God, etc. So the study schools are, are meant to kind of address this idea of, you know, spiritual formation, education, these lifelong processes, um, and so in America it becomes more about this, this idea. And so here's this concern of, you know, wanting to educate children, develop them, uh, help them uh, progress spiritually, and so the Sunday schools um, you know, really participate as part of this. Now, this fits in then to the benevolent empire in the 19th century, in that the benevolent empire is developing all these societies, but well, one of them was the American Sunday School Union. And the American Sunday School Union was an attempt to try and bring some uniformity across denominations regarding the curriculum taught in Sunday schools. And so um, there is this uh, attempt to try and uh, standardize curriculum, develop curriculum, 
that can be used by a wide variety of Protestant denominations to um, try and um, educate children. Now, the American Sunday School Union started in 1824, so it's starting at this time period where Stone and Campbell are kind of at their height. Originally, they're opposed to the American Sunday School Union. They're not necessarily opposed to Sunday schools, but they are opposed to the society because they feel like this is just one more denominational type of structure. Um, it, it's more fostering division. It's supporting denominationalism rather than uh, Christian unity. But Stone, on the other hand, likes the idea of using the Sunday school to teach poor, particularly poor children, um, how to read. And so he thinks there's a benefit there. But this, uh, the structure that Protestants are trying to put together, he feels, is, is, is not as uh, useful. That's the 1820s. By the 1840s, though, um, there is an effort alongside the American Christian Missionary Society to try and form a Sunday school society that is going to help provide and promote Sunday school programs in churches. So by the 1840s, there is this kind of institutionalizing of Sunday schools uh, in church in the Restoration Movement, um, where there had been opposition. Uh, eventually, many states started uh, with. Restoration Movement members in various states started uh, Sunday school state organizations. Uh, these ideas were promoted by Isaac Eric, John McGarvey, a lot of those people we talked about in the 19th century. Well, you have on the one hand this Protestant attempt to produce materials and train teachers, you know, very institutional type of concept. And the Restoration Movement, um, largely they're, they're wanting to produce their own literature instead of using that produced like by the Sunday School Union. And a lot of the focus is the study of the Bible. Uh, eventually, uh, the Disciples of Christ, as the split occurs, the Disciples of Christ would go on form a publishing house, uh, they would even be one of the first um, schools and religious groups to develop in their colleges a religious education major, where people could major in religious education, whether that would be you know, focused on a Sunday school program or uh, private, uh, private Christian schools, something like that. So that's the trajectory of the, the disciples. Our focus, though, is more on the Church's Christ. Um, and so by the 20th century, um, many Churches of Christ had supported and, and were using the Sunday School, this idea of separating um, people by age groups. But a variety of concerns developed uh, among Churches of Christ. So Sunday School. Um, they started at the Scottish No, 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 no. It, it had started in the uh, the 18th century um, over in England and come over to the United States. Oh, really? Is that all? Yeah. And so the disciples are kind of like participating in this, but instead of using the literature that a lot of like the Methodist, Baptists, and Presbyterians tended to use the same literature to teach these Sunday schools, they're starting their own uh, literature and, and you know, they, they eventually. Uh, the disciples will become, become much more institutional in doing that um, okay. you know, because of holding on to the missionary society and those kind of things. Eventually, though, in the Churches of Christ, there were a couple of concerns that developed. Um, one was, for a lot of Protestant denominations in the late 19th, early 20th century, Sunday schools were often operated as something outside of the congregation. It was kind of a, a distinct unit from the congregation, from the, the worship and work of the church. And so here are these members of Churches of Christ who have been opposed to things like the missionary society because it is something outside the congregation. And so 
when these Sunday schools are started and they're looking at you know these uh, these other denominations and saying, okay, this is this seems to be something outside the church. So there's that concern. Secondly, um, the children were often taught by women, and so there's a little concern about well, what role do women have in the church? Um, and then also, you know, once you have a male who has been baptized. Can a woman still teach that um, that male um, and be in uh, compliance with the teachings in First uh, Timothy chapter two about women not teaching men? So there's there's the question of you know is this supposed to be something that's part of the congregation? Is it separate from the congregation? Uh, the role of women also becomes an issue, um, but the greater issues were, for some people, there was no scriptural authorization for a church to have a Sunday school. Now remember, Churches of Christ are tending towards the view of scriptural silence that says, if there's not authorization for it, if there's not a positive command that says, do this, then you shouldn't do it. Well, there's no positive command about Sunday school. Furthermore, they would argue that uh, the education of children was left to the parents, not to the church. So there's a growing group within Churches of Christ that are concerned about the presence of Sunday schools. So you have developing a non-Sunday school wing within Churches of Christ that did not use the Sunday school program. A lot of a lot of churches in churches of Christ are developing it and using it. Um, eventually, journals like the Gospel Advocate, um, some other uh, popular journals among churches of Christ are producing literature for Sunday schools, um, from the youngest kids the whole way up to uh, adults. Other times, there's other literature that kind of borrows from denominational Sunday school literature, but would be slightly modified. Other publishing houses develop uh, as well. So the non-Sunday school churches um, develop minority a group largely in places like Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas. Um, my wife is from Oklahoma. And she is from a tiny little town of like 1,200 people in Oklahoma. There are two churches of Christ in that tiny town because there was a split between the group. Both of them are non-Sunday school churches. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are, there are a, it seems like that region right in there, Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, that's where a majority of those churches are that are non-Sunday school churches. You'll find a few scattered in other places. Uh, but most churches of Christ you know, use the Sunday school type of, of program. Usually, of course, within the context of um, just it's another ministry within in the church. So, that, so her particular church in Oklahoma does have Sunday school. Well, they actually went to uh, a nearby town because they did have a Sunday school. <laughs> but they, there's two congregations that, that right there in that tiny little town of 1,200 people. Yeah. <laughs> and there's two... Yeah, it was, it, there was a church split and all sorts of things, but yeah, it's, uh, uh, but Oklahoma, of course, is one of those places. What you also see kind of developing closely connected um, that kind of also split among the churches of Christ that's kind of connected to this issue is um, what are known as the uh, one cup churches of Christ. So the, the, while the one cup churches are largely, their issue is, has to do with community, not so much Sunday school. But a lot of the one cup churches tend to be non-Sunday school churches. So the division that happens is within the non-Sunday school churches where some are one cup, some are multiple cups. The question is, could, uh, is it allowable to use more than one cup in communion? 
or or should it be just one cup? Now, to us today, if we're you know not part of that that wing, uh, you know, we might not seem like that big of a deal to have multiple cups. But tell me, this comes again out of that mindset of you know, the positive command. So Jesus talks about in Matthew 26, for example. Uh, in Matthew 26, 27, when Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, he takes the cup, singular. And so these one-cup churches believe that um, you know, there was only to be one cup. When you look at um, Mark and Luke, Jesus says, divide it among yourself, right? So it wasn't the idea that they were all drinking from the same cup. So, but, but essentially the idea that comes for these churches. Uh, don't have Sunday schools and only use uh, one cup in communion. And that that split takes um, takes place in the uh, 1930s. There were other things that continued to develop uh, around this issue of uh, institutionalism. You know, there had been a variety of educational institutions developing within the Restoration Movement since the beginning of it. And we've talked about some of those schools, preacher training groups, colleges um, that had all began uh, in the, the 19th century. But in the 20th century, there was an even greater concern. So a sizable group of colleges developed within the Restoration Movement after the Civil War and into the 20th century. Most of those new colleges that developed tended to be in the more Churches of Christ wing of the Restoration Movement because a lot of the colleges in the 19th century tended to go with the disciples when the split took place. And so Churches of Christ start, had to start their own college. Also, when the split happened, most of the colleges that were in existence went with the disciples. And so the Church of Christ started their own colleges to have education. Well, eventually, yeah, you know, that's, that's more of this kind of 1940s, um, World War II kind of, you know, but the early 20th century, so like the... Uh, National Bible School, which becomes David Lipscomb, uh, well, Lipscomb College and then Lipscomb University would be an example of this. Harding University uh, starts, they're, they're kind of that late 19th, early 20th century. What you also see in this post-Civil War period is the development of a variety of state universities. There hadn't been too many before this of these universities supported by state, provided state funding, what are often known as the land grant universities. Um, you know, some of your usually you know, universities that have the name of the state in them. Uh, a lot of those tend to be these land grant universities that start after the Civil War. So there's this general um, educational development post Civil War into the 20th century. A lot of colleges associated with the Churches of Christ start off as, uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, they start off as schools that are preparing people, predominantly men, for ministry, so, um, and particularly preaching. Um, you know, there's, there's not really too many other um, ministry uh, focuses at this time. So the focus is predominantly preparing people to preach. Within the um, disciples in the 20th century, of course, there are, are already those institutions like um, Bethany uh, College, for example, um, a couple other colleges as well um, that are maintained. But here you have the, the Churches of Christ doing this huge institution building of colleges. The disciples kind of decrease that to focus on the ones they already have. So instead of making a lot of new ones, they're focused on, um, you know, kind of uh, 
that established, really focusing on the ones that are already established. So you have this boom in building of uh, colleges that takes place. And this is part of institutionalizing. Another aspect of institutionalizing that takes place in this kind of this 19th, 20th century bridge here, what, what's known as the Bible chair movement. Now, beginning in the late 19th century, especially in these land-grant universities, religion was not taught in public education. And so throughout the 19th and 20th century, uh, as these new universities are started, religion is not to be a part of that because they are supported by the state. And so the separation of church and state and, and federal funding gets involved, uh, those kind of things. So, um, with those developments, and with a lot of students turning to state education as opposed to Christian colleges in the early 20th century, there was an effort to try and find some way to provide some sort of religious education to those individuals who were getting their degrees at a state institution uh, as opposed to a, a Christian college. So the Restoration Movement on both sides, both the Disciples and the Church of Christ, start developing what become known as the Bible Chairs. These were uh, positions that were funded by people within the movement, usually a particular congregation close to a big college, and usually it just started out as an academic lecture series where um, you know, the, the congreg local congregation would uh, bring in somebody who had advanced education in Bible and would invite you know, um, students you know, to come and hear this lecture. Eventually, though, it's provided religious education at the state institutions without state funding. So it was a way for students at state colleges or universities to have some religious education, but the state wasn't paying for it, the state wasn't necessarily supporting it, and the state wasn't requiring it. Also, a lot of these were under the control of the local church. The first one of these Bible chairs appears to have been the University of Michigan in 1893. Um, there was one at the University of Virginia by 1899. And then they continued to pop up in a variety of places, University of Texas um, and other places. Eventually, some of these universities would offer credit, usually a minimal credit, for courses taken under the Bible chairs. So you could take a course and maybe get uh, two credits or three credits towards your degree. Not a lot. You couldn't major in religion at the, at the let's say, the University of Michigan, um, but you could take a couple courses, a course or two, and get a couple credits towards your, your bachelor's degree. We're not talking campus ministry. Campus ministry is not really something that develops until like the late 20th century, post-World War II. Now certainly there's probably you know, some ministerial, pastoral, counseling types of things that took place with students, and you know, a lot of those Bible chairs would have been ministers as well as being, um, as well as having advanced degrees. Uh, but the main focus is the academics. Eventually, um, some of these uh, would move into becoming a religion type of department. Uh, at Virginia, the university made the Bible chair department in 1909. Um, there's still kind of, you know, that very um, position, that difficult position of, well, it's, it's kind of part of the university, but it's not because the state doesn't fund it. Um, today, of course, you can study religion at the University of Virginia and a lot of other, other state universities from a non-sectarian, non-professing type of position. Um, a ruling was made in the Supreme Court in the 1960s that religion could be taught as long as it wasn't necessarily promoted. Right? And so you're not established, so you can teach world religions 
uh, you can study religion as a human phenomenon, those kind of things. But in the early 20th century, that wasn't something that you did. If you wanted to study religion, you went to a seminary or you went to a Christian college. Uh, the Churches of Christ appear to have jumped on this uh, beginning in 1918 uh, at the University of Texas. It was uh, under the control of Abilene Christian College, uh, which is now Abilene Christian University. Uh, Abilene was uh, a junior college at the time, and so you know there's not a they're not offering a bachelor's degree or anything like that. So if somebody wanted a bachelor's degree, they'd have to go to um, the University of Texas or someplace like that. Um, the University of Texas eventually would allow uh, two credits to be applied towards the bachelor's there by taking courses under the, uh, the Bible chair. Basically, a lot of these Bible chairs, as, you, as universities began to be able to teach religion in the late, later part of the 20th century, the Bible chair movement really declined because there was not the need for it, uh, and, and there was not really a, a place for it. And so that's where you kind of see this movement morph from the academic focus into a more campus ministry type of thing. And so you see this campus ministry at the variety of these uh, universities today. You also see the development of uh, what are known as Disciples Divinity Houses, uh, one at the University of Chicago and one at Vanderbilt uh, that are still present, still active. Uh, essentially, these were houses connected with the graduate schools of these two institutions, University of Chicago and Vanderbilt, that provided housing, financial aid, some instruction, um, but they did not grant degrees. And so if you were um, member of the Disciples of Christ and we're going to study at University of Chicago or going to study at uh, Vanderbilt. You, you can maybe get housing at one of these places or maybe even some financial aid as a student from the Disciples of Christ. Not surprisingly, of course, there was um, some opposition related to the colleges as well. Um, and I, I did not Sorry, I didn't uh, flesh that out in my uh, slides. Uh, so let's talk about opposition to the colleges. I'm going to give you everything on that one slide instead of uh, breaking it down. So as these colleges develop, there is opposition from the conservative wing of the Restoration Movement and into the 20th century. Benjamin Franklin, for example, uh, was one of those who was opposed to education for ministers. Um, Remember, as the, uh, as the Restoration Movement develops, one of the things that's kind of uh, a part of this is this concern of this elite clerical class, the educated clergy, and how they treat the common Christians. So there had been kind of this concern. But a lot of members of the Restoration Movement also felt that ministers should be educated to some, some extent. But throughout the 19th century, as these splits, these cracks are developing, one of those was this kind of lower class, upper class uh, kind of crack, uh, where you know, a lot of the people going to colleges like Bethany and others for ministerial training are kind of adopting these kind of middle class or upper class prejudices uh, and are wanting to be paid what a lot of the lower class people uh, feel are, are these huge salaries, uh, et cetera. Um, after Franklin's death, uh, one of the major opponents of colleges was a man named Daniel Summer. Summer was born in 1850 in Maryland to Methodist parents, um, but eventually becomes uh, part of the Restoration Movement, uh, attends uh, Bethany College, uh, but this is after Alexander Campbell has died. Um, but eventually he's kind of drawn to the thinking of Benjamin Franklin. So even though he's educated at college, you know, he's still kind of influenced by uh, a lot of things that Franklin is saying. Eventually will become a uh, writer for the American Christian Review, which was Franklin's um, 
uh, journal. He begins preaching in a variety of places, including Indianapolis. Um, and it kind of represents this, uh, uh, this unusual aspect, right? The churches of Christ tend to be southern rural. Summer is representative of this urban, northern, midwestern aspect of the churches of Christ. So he's kind of unique compared to other um, people at the time. When Franklin dies, there's a variety of people that, that, that eventually are owners of the American Christian Review, kind of changes hands a couple times, eventually ends up, um, Summer uh, is in control of it. Uh, regains some of its prominence other, under it, uh, and really gets involved in um, this kind of debating type of approach, debating people outside the Churches of Christ, um, and some within the movement. In 1889, Summer will participate in writing what's known as the Address and Declaration. If you remember, Thomas Campbell had written Declaration and Address as a call towards unity, separation from denominationalism. Summer's Address and Declaration is a work that called for people to separate from congregations that supported instrumental music and missionary societies. Those that supported those things, in Summer's view, uh, were not to be considered fellow Christians. They kind of abandoned the faith. So he becomes really focused on this idea of the need for uh, plain talking. So Christ and the apostles were plain. So was the gospel. There was not a need for training in rhetoric. There was not a need for uh, any sort of advanced education, even though he had some, uh, to preach the gospel. Those things were unnecessary. And so he's kind of trying to support, even though he's urban, Midwestern, he's very supportive of the rural agrarian type of lifestyle. That's the ideal. Yes. Uh, in fact, he said that there were, there were some students at Bethany who were interested in the gospel and others were too modern. And so this, his concern is that a lot of the ministers being produced by colleges like this are not interested in the gospel. And colleges did not support, he claimed, um, preachers interested in the restoration of uh, ancient Christianity. So there's this kind of struggle between these older, uneducated ministers and these newer educated preachers that have been educated in modern colleges. And Summer and others feel that these newer preachers are kind of uh, too full of themselves. And then finally, this opposition is also focused on here are these colleges that are not under the oversight of an eldership. They are extra congregational types of organizations. And so they're actually, in their minds, usurping the roles and power of the local congregation. So on the one hand, you have represented in summer, in the summer right wing of Churches of Christ, um, this opposition to colleges because of the sociological output um, in this kind of class struggle. Uh, you also have this concern of here are these colleges operating outside of the local congregation, sometimes supplanting the work of the local congregation. And so there's concern about that aspect. On the other hand, there were others that were different than some. They're still opposed to colleges, but they come from a different perspective. Their concern is, can a congregation financially support a college? Now, the question is not so much individuals supporting a college, providing financial support. Right, um, you, know, uh, you know, giving to a college. The question becomes: Can a congregation out of the church treasury take funds that have been collected from that congregation and use it to support a college which is not a congregation, which is actually outside the local church? Now, Summers' influence is mostly Midwest. This second group, the group that is concerned about congregational support, is largely people in Texas and Tennessee. 
they do share some of Summer's concerns of educated ministers kind of thinking themselves better than their congregations. But their greater concern is this idea of financial support and if it's okay to take money from the church and, and use it for these colleges. Largely for a lot of the opponents, colleges, even though they were Christian colleges, were doing secular work. They were educational institutions. They were not the church. So, and especially as some of these institutions turn into baccalaureate degree granting institutions, where you're not getting a degree in Bible, you're getting a degree in something else. Right? And so you're, you're going there as a Christian school, but it's not, and you're studying the Bible, but you're not getting a degree in Bible. Right? You're not going into preaching. You're going into some other kind of thing. So if that starts happening, it's very much more a, this is a secular work. So can a church take funds gathered by the church? Can it take those funds and give it to an institution that is largely secular? Now, most support throughout the 19th century into the 20th century for colleges have come from individuals. But in the 20th century, there is more of a concerted effort from the from the standpoint of the colleges themselves to try and gain support from churches for colleges. Right? So there's these kind of fundraising drives that are being done by colleges to try and raise money. One of the most vocal support, uh, vocal supporters of congregations supporting colleges was G.C. Brewer. So Summer was against colleges, Brewer was for colleges, and was for uh, congregational support of colleges. So you know, Brewer is the one that really promotes the idea that churches can take money out of the church treasury and give it to a Christian college. Um, Brewer was born in Tennessee uh, to Baptist parents, eventually baptized into a church, uh, church of Christ. He begins debating and preaching shortly after his baptism and will continue that through the rest of his life. Uh, he will attend the Nashville Bible School and in this kind of early 20th century, mid 20th century period, becomes very prominent in promoting several things that we would call institutionalism. The idea of a located preacher. Um, we've talked about how that had kind of been an issue in the 19th century, and the Church of Christ has largely been opposed to the idea of located preachers. Well, he was born. Um, I, I don't have the year on him. Yeah, but sometime in the late 19th century. So Brewer is very supportive of this idea of located preachers. He's very supportive of the idea of trying to build large congregations, as opposed to these small congregations that are kind of dotting the landscape. Large, you know, he's trying to really grow the membership, as opposed to having these you know, smaller congregations. Yes, yeah. so you get a lot of smaller. Yeah, you have a lot of smaller congregations, um, which is true of most. Uh, religious groups at the time. Uh, you only see these large car uh, congregations in urban centers, uh, you know, like your New Yorks or uh, you know, some of your big cities, Nashville, uh, something like that. But most religious groups have, you know, if you look at the entirety of the United States at the time, there's a lot of small congregations, churches, and then these bigger churches in these urban centers. There. So Brewer's very kind of pushing this institutionalism. Not, to, not denominationalism. He's not trying to you know, su support the idea of, of forming into a church hierarchy, but uh, you know, he's, he's encouraging things like uh, church bulletins, which is institutional because you're kind of, you know, you are talking about the programs of the church as opposed to just kind of what's going on. Um, you know, having a membership list, having a directory, all things that were not very prominent in Churches of Christ uh, until the 19, uh, middle of the 1900s. Uh, he was also very supportive of the idea of uh, churches cooperating together for mission work 
and for the support of colleges. And so, beginning in the 1930s, first at the Abilene Christian College lectureships, but then in the pages of Gospel Advocate, were consistently puts, encourages people to be giving, uh, congregations to be giving uh, to colleges. Um, now, one thing that might have made this more of a flashpoint had to do with the relationship between G.C. Brewer and Foy Wallace, Jr. Now, remember, we talked about this a little bit ago. Wallace had been so focused in the early 20th century on premillennials. Well, Brewer was one of those people who didn't support premillennialism, but didn't support um, Wallace's attitudes either. I mean, he felt he was too militant, felt he was too combative. With that, a variety of, uh, of these Christian colleges also became very critical of Floyd e. Wallace's style. They might have agreed with him theologically on some things, but they really feel that his attacks against premillennialism and, and other issues have just, um, you know, been too harsh. And again, both groups are kind of opposed to premillennialism. It's just one is feeling that Wallace is just, you know, he's kind of just an attack dog. Well, that's one of the things that probably committed, uh, contributed to Wallace becoming so vocally opposed to congregation supporting colleges. <laughs> right? So that probably upset him and, and led him to becoming uh, more opposed to this. Especially in the post-World War II period when uh, a variety of uh, soldiers are coming home and there's the passing of the GI Bill which provides veterans with funds for education. Well, that funding could be used in a variety of places, including some of these colleges, uh, these Christian colleges. And because of that, a lot of colleges are needing to expand their facilities, are needing to you know, uh, provide more services because they have this sudden influx of students uh, after World War II. And, and so there are, are, there's really that need to um, ramp up uh, this, uh, this encouragement of congregations to support the churches. You know, it's, it's more than just getting a bunch of individuals together. You need something more sizable. Abilene, for example, in the years after um, World War II started, launched a $3 million funding drive, which might not seem like a lot in the grand scheme of higher education today, but, you know, I mean, $3 million is still a lot of money today. So just imagine what it was post-World War II. Uh, and so a lot of the people that were opposed to uh, these Christian colleges were just stunned at, you know, what was being asked of the churches to, to do. Um, M.D. Hardeman, who was president of Freed Hardeman College in Tennessee, also uh, began fundraising uh, in uh, those years after World War II. Um, he, too, had a rather uh, challenging relationship with Boy e. Wallace. Unlike a lot of other individuals, he had been very supportive of Wallace's premillennial crusade. And he was very supportive in how Wallace had tried to get rid of premillennialism in the church. But, on the other hand, Hardeman was very against and critical of those who were not willing to support colleges. And especially becomes critical of Wallace and saying, well, you know, he's unstable because he had been a pacifist and then World War II happened and he's not a pacifist anymore, so how can you really trust him? Well, Wallace's response essentially was, um, you know, Hardeman is only friendly to people he can use. Right? And so there's, again, this kind of division and tension and, and uh, very vocal opposition, hard feelings developing on both sides of this issue over whether churches can take that money and, and use um, that support. Something similar takes place with um, 
orphan homes and orphan schools. As early as the 1840s, there were orphan schools in the restoration movement. And we, we mentioned, highlighted a couple of those very briefly in some of the places we were doing in the 19th century. But really after World War II, or excuse me, after the Civil War, we're still in the 19th century, after the Civil War, there's a much greater need for orphanages and orphan schools because of the amount of children that are without their fathers because of the Civil War, et cetera. And so there's an effort to try and help widows and orphans. I mean, they're not the only ones doing this. Other, uh, I mean, there have been other things within Catholicism much earlier than all of this, but as far as institutionalism within the Restoration Movement. Plus, there's also the need for child labor, so a lot of things are taking place for orphans in this post-Civil War period. In the Disciples' wing, because they're moving towards more institutions, there's eventually a national organization developed to coordinate some of this. In the Churches of Christ wing, however, there isn't that uh, attempt. Certainly there's the belief uh, in benevolence. Nobody's really denying that. Even those opposed, that will become opposed to orphan homes, believe in the need to, you know, take care of widows and orphans, right? James 1.27 quite clearly says, take care of widows and orphans. So, in the Churches of Christ, a variety of residential homes developed to try and help uh, with the um, with the taking care of orphans and, and other children in, in difficult positions. But the questions become very similar. Can these orphan homes be supported out of the budget of a congregation since they're not often the work of a specific congregation um, or these these homes are getting support from multiple congregations. So it's, it's, it's outside the congregation. So can you support something with the funding of a congregation, you know, out of the church budget, the church treasury? Again, there's not the opposition to, if you as an individual want to, with your money, support this. The question becomes, can a church collectively, out of the church treasury, use that money for that? Plus, there is the, continu the continual question of, um, you know, does the New Testament allow for orphan homes? There are no, there are no passages that say, uh, thou shalt have orphan homes. And so, if you're operating from that mindset of it has to say it to do it, um, then there's that question. Um, you know, the, the, also the question of there's no oversight of the elders. So, if this is a Congregational work should the elders be overseeing it? So they operate. The orphan homes are often operating independently. They're run by Christians, but they are not part of, you know, a specific church or anything like that. And so a lot of the people that become opposed to orphan homes say that individual churches should should take care of the orphans in their midst. Right in their local area, but they weren't really supportive of this idea of an organization outside of the church that the church could support. Um, and really, one of the things where it seems like this comes up is when there's this discussion of churches supporting colleges. And B. Hardman made the point that people had no problems supporting orphan homes, which were extra-congregational and outside the church, which actually kind of makes people think, well, now should we should be supporting orphan homes. So you know, it doesn't seem like there's this problem with orphan homes until Envy Hardman specifically brings it up with respect to orphan homes being like colleges. If you can support the orphan home, why can't you support the college? And then people say, well, maybe we shouldn't be supporting the orphan homes either. All of these kind of things are kind of starting uh, what we're seeing is a movement, a non-institutional movement um, that uh, is developing within the churches of Christ. And we'll pick up with that and look at that um, in more ways the institutionalism is taking place 
especially as we look at the 1950s and the growth that's taking place in Churches of Christ. We'll pick up and talk about more of that on Thursday.